Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, it is your Psych, Culture, and Society class. Uh, today, I, your host, will be walking you through uh, Chapter 7, which is Living in Multicultural Worlds. So let's get into it. What are our themes of this chapter? Well, how does intercultural uh, contact affect the way people think? And how do majority and minority cultures coexist with each other? Beginning with talking about uh, uh, acculturation, acculturation research, and what is acculturation? It's a process by which people migrate to and learn a culture that's different from their heritage culture. We're going to talk about some pros and cons. Pros of this research is that there's a sizable pool of existing research, and, a, and it has an important practical implications. Cons. Despite the importance of this topic, this research area is criticized as not being very coherent. Conclusions in the area are often vague or more theoretically grounded than empirical, and the findings are contradictory and often hard to generalize. So these uh, conclusions, uh, these are kind of uh, typical um, uh, limitations to any research uh, or psychology research and human behavior research in general, but here um, the research is especially uh, theoretical. Um, and it's difficult to generalize uh, due to a whole host of reasons that we'll get into. And what are some of those reasons? Well, people migrate for different reasons. As refugees, for example, to seek wealth or to study abroad. People migrate to different contexts, such as cultural ghettos, homogenous neighborhoods, cultures that actively discriminate against them. People's heritage uh, cultures vary in similarity to the culture of the new environment, and individuals have different personalities, goals, and motivations. So not only do you have different reasons um, for uh, migration, but people migrate to different contexts, and they bring with them different uh, individual factors, such as personalities, goals, and motivations. And you also, as I stated, have to keep in mind uh, what culture you are uh, migrating to. With, those, with uh, similarities and differences having different impacts on the acculturation process. Let's continue with uh, defining some terms. Migrants are people who move from their heritage culture, that is their original culture, to a host culture, that is their new culture. There are two types of uh, migrants, sojourners, which are people who intend to stay temporarily, and immigrants, and people who are, are who, which in this textbook is defined as people who intend to stay permanently. Changing attitudes towards a host culture. Moving to a new culture involves psychological adjustment, which can often be associated with stress. There's an uh, acculturation U-shaped curve model, which is shown here, and there are three uh, stages to this uh, model. And the first being honeymoon. So this is in the beginning due to novelty, culture shock, um, that of also as a crisis stage, which often includes homeless, uh, homesickness, and adjustment as people eventually become increasingly competent in the host culture. And the U-shaped curve, you can see that the period of stress is mainly during the show, uh, culture shock period, and stress is likely to degree, decrease during adjustment. So this is kind of um, uh, a typical, well, kind of um, within um, colloquially understood attitudes towards host culture. So you get there, you're very excited, you're in a new city. But then over time, you know, you've, um, the weight of differences, again, those weight of differences can vary. Uh, depending on the host country and the uh, country of origin for a migrant um, or a, so a sojourner. And um, and then, uh, so, which can, uh, you know, impact the uh, degree of culture shock, but kind of in general, you know, some kind of culture shock, you're missing home, maybe there's some adjustment issues, missing your family, etc. And then over time, seeing adjustment period where you become increasingly competent in your cultures and in your uh, host culture's norms, maybe language differences, or just kind of just knowing how to interact in the city, maybe make new friends. Uh, so this is a classic U-shaped curve. Sometimes people undergoing uh, acculturation do not go through the adjustment uh, stage. So basically, in other words, they do not seem to recover from cultural shock and continue to feel negatively in the host culture. Um, this is referred to as an L-shaped curve. There's a honeymoon stage, a cultural uh, shock stage, and then there's no adjustment stage. So it kind of looks like an L, maybe with some flare at the top of the L. Uh, it never goes back up to create that U-shaped curve. Um, reflecting the fact that uh, these researchers argue that, that there is no adjustment phase. 
for um, some migrants or so um, uh, or so uh, sojourners. And there's very limited research on this topic, so it's possible that in a homogenous culture, people simply need longer time to adjust. So kind of the idea here, going back to those factors that we talked about, all the different reasons why people migrate, the personal resources, both social uh, and uh, financial resources uh, brought to uh, their new uh, host country, um, and uh, the cultural distance between uh, um, the uh, their uh, host country and their country of origin, and we'll define that uh, momentarily. But kind of the degrees of dif differences between those two cultures, uh, there might just be a longer period of cultural shock, or kind of a less steep hill um, towards adjustment. So instead of kind of like a sharp U, maybe it's kind of a, a more of an incline, which suggests a longer period before reaching adjustment. And again, this is kind of um, very limited research on this topic, and we don't know. It's more theoretical um, than empirical at this point. There's also an interesting concept known as reverse cultural shock. It's, uh, it's important to note that people often go through a similar pattern after returning home, and that's what this uh, concept is uh, referring, um, referring to. There's three phases, just like the kind of the uh, acculturation phrase uh, the other way, <laughs> you know, going to a new uh, uh, country rather than returning home. But for, for here, returning home, you have your honeymoon stage, which is when you're initially happy to see family and friends, and eat familiar foods. Then a reverse cultural shock, where you don't feel quite at home anymore, and don't seem to fit into uh, their home culture, and then adjustment back to home culture. Now, I've personally uh, kind of experienced this uh, multiple times, uh, living in um, Scotland for about a year, and living in Kenya for um, about a little over three months, and then coming back, and uh, everything being different. And, um, you know, he's a Kenyan, no one kind of looking uh, differently, no one, uh, language is different, uh, food is different, Ev literally everything is different. Um, and the weather is different. <laughs> so kind of like every part of, uh, you know, your existence is, is different. And that can take um, uh, some, that takes a certain uh, amount of time to adjust to, or um, possibly, you know, kind of like the uh, L-shaped curve uh, that I discussed for uh, um, attitudes uh, towards your host culture, maybe uh, not adjusting back to your home culture and saying, you know what, <laughs> screw this hometown, I'm out of this, this place and I like where I was, or you maybe just moved to somewhere else. So um, this is an interesting concept. Several factors predict adjustment to new host cultures. Those are cultural distance, cultural fit, and, and uh, acculturation strategies. So let's break these down in more detail, beginning with cultural distance, which is defined as how much two cultures differ in their overall ways of life. There's a closer match between native language in English, then, and then easier to learn English. More heritage culture and host culture similarity than less uh, acculturative stress. For example, more successful adjustment in Malaysian exchange students who studied in Singapore than in New Zealand. New Zealand. So kind of the idea here is that um, this cultural difference uh, being the, uh, that you know, depending on the uh, degree of differences uh, in particular cultures, you will have a uh, larger uh, kind of um, uh, crisis stage, uh, a larger um, um, uh, culture shock, uh, which will thus take a longer to kind of adjust. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the um, ways in which the that uh, degree of of shock can increase is just uh, language differences. So. Um, if you migrate to a country that speaks the same language as you, there's going to be less cultural differences, or sorry, less uh, cultural distance, uh, which makes it easier for you to adjust uh, because, you know, you don't have to, every, every road sign you see is not different, you're able to communicate with people, possibly make more uh, friends. Um, if you're working at a job, maybe, you know, go out with your coworkers, etc. And not only that, but languages, as especially kind of like in the Anglosphere, English-speaking languages, uh, the, um, the similarity in cultures uh, kind of reflect what, well, well, I should say, the similarity in languages will reflect um, kind of similar cultures um, um, to a higher extent than, for example, comparing um, Mandarin and English-speaking uh, countries.
And again, that just so what you're doing here is your um, language or kind of just um, you know larger uh, uh, cultural differences um, uh, overall as measured through cultural distance creates more uh, stress, which then uh, either takes a uh, longer time to adjust to, or depending on kind of the alternative view, uh, maybe that L-shaped curve, maybe that uh, cultural distance, um, once you hit a certain degree of cultural distance, a individual is not able to adjust to that culture. And this is again, kind of all theoretical, but these are possible um, rationales behind these particular uh, shape curves, U and L. Moving on to cultural fit. Which is the degree to which one's personality is more similar to the dominant cultural values in the host culture? Cultural fit is about pers uh, personality, how a person personally fits within a culture. What cultural distance is about distance or difference between two cultures. Okay, so we have two, those are our differences here. We have fit, which is about kind of think, think of it at a individual level, versus um, uh, distance, which is kind of comparing these kind of macro uh, cultures overall to each other. So we got two macro cultures compared against each other versus an individual's um, fitting within a particular culture. So we have different levels here. Macro in macro or an individual in macro. Extra, so for example, extroverted individuals fare well in cultures that are more extroverted. So again, kind of a personality trait matching with that larger um, um, uh, macro cultural value, in this case, extroversion, contributing to uh, the degree to which an individual can adjust. And people with more independent self concepts suffer less distress in acculturating to the United States than those who, than those with more uh, interdependent self concepts. So again, kind of this idea here is trying to see how long it takes an individual from going uh, from that uh, cultural shock, that crisis stage to adjustment. And one of the ideas here, again, this is cultural fit. Uh, so as um, if a person's uh, personality is uh, completely different than the host cultural host cultures, cultural values, then that um, crisis stage may be more severe and thus individuals may take longer to adjust, or again, that would be a U-shaped model, or an L-shaped model, um, the degree to which, at, at, once you hit X uh, level of cultural fit differences, um, you know, so uh, once the differences become at a certain magnitude, maybe an individual is just unable to adjust, and that would kind of be a L-shaped theory. Next, acculturation strategies. When people acculturate to a new culture, there are two main issues to consider. Attitudes towards the host culture. Does the individual participate in the larger society of the host culture? Does the individual seek to fit in? Attitudes toward the heritage culture. Does the individual seek ways to preserve the traditions of his or her, her heritage culture? These two issues lead to, dis to, to distinct acculturation strategies. So kind of just the idea is what uh, attitude are you bringing um, to the acculturation process? What is your strategy? Are you going to participate in it? Are you going to try and fit in? Or are you gonna try and isolate from uh, your host culture? And those um, approaches, those attitudes lead to different uh, strategies. Attitudes toward the host and the heritage cultures are seen as being independent from each other. A person can be high on only one attitude, high on both, or low on both. This yields John Barry's model of four acculturation strategies. So kind of again, we have two different factors here. You can be high on uh, attitude towards your heritage culture and low on attitude towards your host culture. So we have two different scales here and on both you can be high and low. They're not um, uh, correlated with each other in this, in this theory. They're distinct independent scales that you can be high or low on. Our first strategy we're going to talk about is integration, which involves individual attempts to fit in and fully participate in the host culture, while also maintaining their heritage culture, associated with the least acculturative stress and the most successful strategy. Success likely due to least amount of prejudice experience and greatest level of social support due to access to both cultural groups. So kind of just the idea is we have kind of we're plus in both categories. 
uh, we are um, attempting to fit in and fully participate in the host culture while also maintaining a positive view of the heritage culture. So it's kind of double plus here. We got a um, high on both categories, both uh, in your host culture, uh, your view, in your attitudes, in your um, behavior in both culture, uh, both your heritage culture and your host culture. And this is thought to be associated with the least amount of stress and it's thought to be the most uh, successful strategy, possibly because that, you know, least amount of stress, which may uh, elongate that um, cultural shock period and may prevent or, and or delay um, uh, adjustment, the adjustment period. And stress is uh, thought to uh, be associated with um, a prejudice within um, particular host countries. So if there is a, uh, a, a country that you're uh, migrating to that has a history of conflict or racial or ethnic um, um, stereotypes and negativity towards that group, there, there is likely to be higher uh, acculturation stress. Uh, which can um, lead to uh, different uh, strategies of acculturation. And in the case of uh, integration, it's thought and theorized that um, individuals uh, take this strategy when there are lower levels of prejudice experienced uh, by that uh, migrating group. Our next strategy is marginalization. And this is the opposite um, attitudes. Um, of integration. In this case, marginalization, we have negative attitudes towards both the host and heritage culture. There's no effort to engage with the host and uh, heritage cultures. It's rare and the least successful strategy. It may characterize third culture kids, and we're going to talk about them uh, more at the end of this lecture. But kind of the idea here is that these are kids who uh, migrate uh, to multiple cultures. And so, for example, born in one culture, and then live in another country, uh, uh, culture, and then um, uh, for some period of time, and then move again. So maybe um, people working in an NGO, some kind of international NGO, or uh, some kind of uh, military children who are traveling on to different bases. But kind of the idea here, again, is that you're just negative across the board on both those measures of, um, in regards to your host and heritage cultures and you make no effort to engage with either of those cultures. Next is assimilation, which involves individual attempts to fit in and fully participate in the host culture and rejection of the heritage culture. Positive attitudes toward host, but negative attitudes towards heritage culture. Participate in the host culture while leaving behind traditions of heritage culture. So kind of straightforward here, kind of the idea here is you're trying to fit in and fully participate, but only in your host culture, and you have negative attitudes or kind of just a rejection overall uh, towards your heritage culture. And finally, separation, which is kind of the opposite of assimilation. In separation, the individual maintains the heritage culture and does not try to fit in with the host culture. Negative attitudes towards host, but positive attitudes toward heritage culture. So kind of the idea here is that um, individuals uh, will migrate to a, a new country and they will reject or have ne negative attitudes towards their host country, but still have positive attitudes towards their heritage culture. And researchers uh, theorize that uh, there are no um, uh, differences in, in um, kind of acculturation outcomes between separation and assimilation strategies. But again, uh, a lot of research still needs to be done on these questions, and there may be variation depending on the factors that we talked about, cultural distance, cultural fit, uh, etc. And as we already talked about, some factors predicting uh, different acculturation strategies, uh, one being when the host culture uh, expresses prejudice against the heritage cultural group, it uh, diminishes individuals from that cultural group to fit in. And people who have distinctly different phys uh, physical characteristics from the host culture are more prone to pursue marginalization and separation. So kind of getting back to the idea of if there's uh, prejudice, some kind of history of abuse between two groups, and um, uh, differences in phys physical characteristics. So this can be racial um, uh, differences or kind of perceived e ethnic differences. Um, associated with uh, particular physical characteristics, um, making it more likely for an individual to pursue marginalization or separation acculturation strategies.
Other factors include those in lower classes and those from indigenous groups also generally adopt separation or marginalization strategies due to frustrations with the host culture. A culture that values cultural diversity and the acceptance of multiculturalism is more likely to encourage integration or assimilation. So, kind of as stated, uh, lower classes um, and, um, and indigenous groups adopting uh, separation are more likely to uh, um, adopt separation or marginalization strategies. And obviously, there are a whole host of um, uh, historical reasons for that. So, in the case of uh, separation uh, strategy, um, just kind of the history of indigenous people being kind of kidnapped and forced to uh, learn. Um, European uh, 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 explorers uh, cultures and you know just recently we, we've seen uh, in Canada uh, just mass of graves of or unmarked graves of indigenous children um, in uh, Catholic schools who were forced to uh, basically try and be uh, acculturated through force um, and kind of that history again that prejudice of in that historical violence uh, contributing to likelihood of particular uh, acculturation strategies, and in that case, separation. So some pitfalls of uh, acculturation, and acculturation may not always be beneficial. Not all cultural habits are inherently good. The immigrant paradox uh, is defined as the children of immigrants may experience more negative outcomes than their parents. And these are just some kind of, uh, or some case studies. So for example, the length of stay in the United States is predicted with uh, certain adverse uh, health outcomes. A study of Vietnamese immigrants in New Orleans found that the less that uh, immigrant, the Vietnamese uh, immigrants were integrated, the more they achieved in school and the more upwardly mobile they were. A study of Latino immigrants showed that the more they acculturated to mainstream culture, the worse they performed in school. So there could be numerous reasons for this. So maybe um, future um, uh, ch um, subsequent uh, generations of, of, of immigrants the children of immigrants, or the grandchildren of immigrants, uh, kind of losing the uh, protective factors um, which are thought to buffer the uh, stressors associated with being an immigrant. So maybe uh, support systems within your family, um, being in touch with family back in your host country, but just kind of things that are cultural uh, buffers or protective factors which are thought to uh, kind of um, limit the uh, effect or kind of um, uh, stunt, stunt the effect of stress on an individual. And maybe over time, um, generations lose those um, cultural protective factors. Also, in the case of Vietnamese immigrants in New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, after being hit with uh, multiple hurricanes, um, the schools uh, were kind of completely defunded and um, the uh, outcomes, educational outcomes within those schools were uh, very poor. Um, so you can imagine that um, immigrant groups that go to uh, particular uh, cities, in this case, New Orleans, that have been defunded, that have been kind of ravaged by natural disasters and uh, subsequent uh, uh, public policy decisions, um, kind of creating distance from those stressful uh, circumstances kind of actually serving as a benefit uh, to those immigrant communities. And kind of the same thing um, you can argue for Latino immigrants, uh, maybe particular schools are uh, underfunded or um, um, act as a traumatic experiences for particular uh, racial minorities or uh, lower class individuals um, due to uh, not only increased security and, and um, within a school setting or being uh, located in poor neighborhoods and kind of creating distance uh, be uh, between those um, neighborhood stressors um, be serving as kind of a, uh, a buffer, a protective factor against experiencing uh, the same levels of stress as other uh, groups who, or non-migrant groups are experiencing within that neighborhood or in this case, uh, school setting. Now we're gonna review some challenges. Um, of discrimination, specifically um, identity uh, denial. Discrimination can be a large problem in context where there is intercultural interaction. It can impact the acculturation process in two ways. One, identity denial, which involves the questioning of someone's cultural identity because that person does not match the prototype of the culture. 
often encounter from ethnic minorities who are born in the host culture are asked, quote, no, seriously, where are you really from? Or are assumed to not properly speak the language of the host culture. Researchers found that when, when for example, Asian Americans, quote, American identity is threatened or questioned, such as when they are asked whether they speak English, they were more likely to subsequently assert their American identity by ordering typically American food. This shows how simple interactions can have a strong impact on ethnic groups in a multicultural society. So kind of the idea here is that, uh, in, um, kind of going back to previous slides, that particular cultures have histories with other cultures, um, which can lead to, lead to prejudice, uh, kind of ne negative attitudes uh, towards uh, particular migrant groups, and in this case, in a study of Asian Americans, uh, where uh, individuals kind of you know are questioning their identity or denying that they are um, an American citizen uh, through uh, by leveraging uh, racial um, kind of uh, uh, racism and um, a prejudice overall, um, contributing to the behaviors of um, in this in this case uh, Asian Amer uh, Asian Americans. Um, after and, and the study found that after kind of having their identity questioned, kind of this idea that um, at some level, you know, this is um, really just a kind of small study of ordering American food or what food they order, but you know, following the questioning of their American identity, uh, these individuals having a higher likelihood of kind of ordering something that kind of expresses their American identity. So kind of confirming to themselves that no, I'm in fact. Uh, an American after being subjected to um, a racist comment. The next discrimination factor we're going to talk about is stereotype threat, which occurs when a person is reminded of or thinking about the negative stereotypes about his or her group, even if uh, this person does not believe those stereotypes are true. One consistent finding is that black Americans underperform compared to white Americans in college even after controlling for the level of preparation. Many negative stereotypes exist about black Americans' academic performance, so a black American student will be reminded of those stereotypes in academic settings. Such anxiety leads to stress and subsequently hinders performance. So kind of the idea here is that within a given culture, there are stereotypes about a group, and individuals within that, um, within that stereotype, stereotype group are aware of that stereotype. And even though that, that stereotype can be completely false and that individual does not believe it, they can still be affected by uh, that stereotype. And we're going to review some research on this. So there's this classic study of, of a stereotype a threat, which involved black Americans and white Americans taking a test of verbal items from the GRE, which is a standardized test for entering graduate level programs. One group took the test after first indicating their race, in the second group, there was no race question. Participants just took the test. Black students answered fewer uh, items correctly after indicating their race, and white American students were unaffected by indicating their race. So kind of the idea here is that the stereotype uh, within um, in academic settings in the United States is that uh, black American uh, students are, um, uh, the stereotype exists that they're going to perform worst. And just that question, that kind of that priming, that race question, um, adjusting kind of uh, the cognitive uh, approach to the test by, um, in their performance on the test more specifically, uh, by kind of just uh, planting that, um, uh, or, or um, kind of uh, asking a question that is associated with that stereotype that is their race in this case. And um, individuals who are asked that uh, racial question, or uh, I should say black uh, American students, perform worse than if they didn't, were not asked that question. However, white American students were not uh, affected by the stereotype threat because that stereotype uh, threat does not exist within um, um, American culture and uh, in this uh, when this test was administered and it, I mean it still exists today. So again kind of this idea that even though that individuals may not believe it and it's and it's not true but being reminded of that stereotype threat kind of putting more stress um, and or anxiety on an individual uh, which um, when there's too much stress and anxiety decreases performance on task and this is kind of replicated in numerous studies on stress and anxiety. Continuing on, subtle primes can elicit stereotype threat with dramatic consequences. 
People deal with negative stereotypes by first, or one, disidentifying with the stereotype domain, such as I don't care about school, or avoiding reminders of the stereotype, such as I'm going to drop out of school. Stereotype threat affects groups other than black Americans in areas other than academic performance. The same effect has been found concerning women in math and older adults in memory performance. Some of these effects have recently been questioned in terms of replicability and or size of the effects. So the kind of the idea here is when presented even with subtle uh, priming of a stereotype threat, it affects performance in the case uh, that we just reviewed in, uh, in that study, just a racial question. And people deal with this in uh, kind of two primary ways. One is dis, uh, disidentifying with the stereotype domain. So just, I don't care about school, uh, school doesn't bother me, whatever, it doesn't matter to me anyway. Or they seek to avoid reminders of the stereotype and one way to avoid academic um, reminders of, of stereotypes um, associated with academic performance is literally just dropping out of school. So avoiding it at all costs. It's important to note that Stereotypes threats are seen in multiple groups, as I stated, uh, with women in math and older adults and memory performance. Uh, even when the older adults uh, are, sh are shown, for example, to perform well on a particular task, if you remind them of the stereotype threat, they will perform worse on that threat. Now, the, the last bullet point deals with uh, replicability issues and size of the effects. And there can be a lot of different reasons for this. As we've talked about throughout this class, its culture is not stagnant. Culture is constantly changing. Thus, the stereotype threats will take, um, are expected to take different forms and be more salient in different historical era, eras. And um, this can be reflected in uh, women, in, in case of women in math, kind of over time with more women um, entering STEM fields or kind of just college in general, maybe those stereotypes uh, threats decreasing and new stereotypes uh, increasing. So kind of the fluidity of the culture um, and a particular cultural values and attitudes towards different groups uh, fluctuates at time, you know, so following um, September 11th, uh, Islamist phobia skyrocketed. Um, thus, you would expect to see higher stereotype threats associated with, with um, uh, you know, um, Islamophobia related stereotype threats um, being more salient uh, in um, following September 11th compared to, you know, uh, you know, 1990, for example, even though, you know, not necessarily not that it never existed, but the kind of the idea is that these large macro shifts uh, can make a particular threat more threatening within a specific, specific uh, historical era, even if it already existed. So it's kind of can just be amplified or decreased depending on various circumstances going on in the world, and in, in particular that culture and country. How do we balance or negotiate multiple cultural systems? This is perhaps easiest to consider when thinking about biculturals, people who have two cultural backgrounds. For biculturals, their different cultural experiences impact their self-concept in two ways. The first way is blending, and the second way is frame switching, and we're going to break this down more in detail. Let's begin with blending. People's self-concepts reflect a hybrid of their two cultural word, worlds. Multicultural people appear intermediate on many assessments when compared to monocultural people from different cultures. So for example, Asian American ways of thinking tend to be in between Americans and Asian ways of thinking. So let's look at some empirical examples. So the first study we're gonna look at um, found that when it, Japanese individuals who had lived in Canada for seven, who had lived in Canada for seven months, their self-esteem increased significantly. In contrast, when Canadian individuals had lived in Japan for seven months, their self-esteem decreased significantly. So kind of the idea here is that the cultural values of self-esteem are different. In Japan, cultures um, and individuals uh, report uh, on average lower self-esteem compared to uh, 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 Canadians. And you can see individuals over time um, uh, being uh, acculturated within in that um, particular culture as reflected through the amount of self-esteem change within a culture with Canadians experiencing uh, and reporting lower self-esteem over time and, and uh, Japanese individuals reporting uh, higher levels of self-esteem uh, with time spent in cultures that have um, that value self-esteem in this case uh, uh, Canada. So another more concrete example uh, found that uh, self-esteem levels of Asian Canadians um, well looked at uh, Asian uh, Canadians um, uh, self-esteem levels 
and compare them to white Canadian and Asian self-esteem levels. In this sample, Japanese who had never been abroad scored the lowest on the self-esteem scale, while white Can Canadians scored the highest on the self-esteem scale. Self-esteem levels of Asian Canadians were immediate, intermediate between them. So again, kind of blending um, those uh, cultural values. In the one hand, um, uh, Canadian uh, values, which placing uh, higher value on high levels of self-esteem, while um, um, Asian countries, and specifically um, Japanese or Japan, uh, placing less cultural value on high levels of self-esteem. So um, children who were uh, Asian Canadians kind of falling in between blending those two cultural values together and thus kind of coming to this intermediate level of self-esteem. So placing themselves in between uh, white uh, Canadian levels of self-esteem and Japanese levels of self-esteem. And next, frame switching. People maintain multiple self-concepts and switch between them depending on the context. That is, rather than blending two self-concepts, people switch between them. Borrowing from information science, researchers studying frame switching have proposed that cultures are represented in the mind as a network of specific information that is activated by context. Code switching refers to a specific instance of frame switching, which is describing the way people act and present themselves to others in their respective cultures. The main distinction between frame switching in code switching is that frame switching comes from a psychological perspective and focuses more on how people think or the cognitive reasons why they may behave differently in different contexts. At some level, every culture is a blend from somewhat, something else, even though people have beliefs about quote, authentic versus blended cultures. So rather than, uh, whether, uh, rather than uh, blending, um, you know, kind of uh, straightforward with their names, the two, um, self-concepts together um, or, you know, particular cultural values together in the previous example, self-esteem, um, this approach uh, deals with switching between uh, self-concepts. And it's kind of similar to code switching, which is kind of more commonly known, uh, but that really deals with describing how people act and present themselves. So this is like how, th how they're doing it, um, what particular behaviors they're doing and what way they're doing it. While frame switching has to deal with um, this kind of cognitive approach on um, why they do so and um, um, in, in the ways how, how people think about uh, their self-concepts. So this is more of a kind of a, a cognition perspective um, and not dealing with the specific actions that a person is thinking, but why they why are they behaving in particular uh, different ways in particular context and um, how and what what cognitive systems are being leveraged so it's much more cognitive approach versus like looking at a particular behavior so it's what cognitive behaviors kind of or what cognitive cognitive systems and approaches um, are being leveraged to switch between uh, different self concepts and in the case of kind of information scientists the idea is you're presenting with a particular context, particular environmental uh, environments, and which um, activate um, particular um, neural networks associated with particular cognitive systems. So again, it's, it's what we're talking about here is cognitive system, neurological systems underlying this ability to switch between uh, different self concepts, for example. Now let's look at a specific study that kind of hammer home this point, let's make it more concrete. Biculturals not from some cultures within the United States also experience frame switching. Biculturals have been investigated to see whether uh, primes of cultural ideas lead them to switch between different thinking styles. So kind of again, this cognitive approach, in this case we're looking at thinking styles. Students from Hong Kong, chosen due to their country's history as a British colony, were shown images that were neutral, prime Western ideas, such as Mount Rushmore and the Statue of Liberty, prime Chinese ideas, such as a, a Chinese dragon in, in the Great Wall of China. So following um, uh, being shown one of those three images, a neutral image, a Western idea, ideal idea image, and a Chinese uh, idea image, students were then shown a picture of a school of fish and asked why one fish was swimming ahead of the others. Theoretically, 
Participants prime with Chinese ideas were expected to use external attributions, something about the pack, due to less belief that people are bounded entities and a greater belief that they are affected by the environment. External attribution. Participants prime with Western ideas were expected to use internal attributions, something about the fish, due to a greater perception of the impact of dispositions. In, uh, uh, internal attribution. So kind of the idea here is, again, you're shown these uh, th uh, three images, and if you're shown the Western ideal image, that's kind of um, uh, kind of associated with this um, internal attribution of behavior. You're, stat you're an individual, you're making choices, something about me is driving my behavior versus shown a uh, Chinese idea image, uh, which would be associated with a culture that uh, um, uh, explains uh, behavior through external uh, attributions. People are bound into groups and kind of different um, the behavior of individuals within kind of your in-group uh, affecting a person's um, behavior. And what the researchers found, they found that American primes led to the fewest external attributions and Chinese prime led to the most external attributions. Participants from Hong Kong have access to both Western and non-Western ways of thinking, which one they use depends on which one is activated. So kind of the idea here is as stated, as theorized, hypothesized, um, uh, English images, um, or I should say um, American uh, Western idea images, and more specifically American images, uh, Mount Rushmore and um, the uh, Statue of Liberty, um, it could, uh, being associated with fewer external attributions and had the fewest external, at, um, uh, external attributions um, with uh, those images. That is when explaining the fish. So why or the behavior of the fish? So um, if you are primed with uh, one of the images, the Western images, you're less likely to explain the group of fish's behavior in external ways. However, if you're shown um, the Chinese images, you're uh, more likely and most likely, um, and um, uh, individuals uh, overall uh, showed, uh, applied uh, external attributions to explaining the behavior of those fishes um, uh, more than American images or neutral images. So you can see, also see that both uh, images still produce external attributions, but the Chinese prime produced um, uh, a much higher level, a significantly higher level, I should say, of external attributions um, to the behavior of the fish. So just that simple prime was able to elicit par particular ways of thinking. And interestingly, Hong Kong participants, because they have access both to Chinese ways of thinking and, non and uh, Western ways of thinking, and I should say kind of just non-Western ways of thinking uh, more generally, um, they are able to switch. They are able to s frame switch back and forth between different ways of cognitively thinking, that approach to behavior, understanding why people act. That is, they're, mo they're both uh, capable of being primed by um, American images and uh, Chinese images at higher rates than individuals who do not grow up in, uh, who are not bicultural. That is, they do not grow up uh, being exposed to both ways of thinking. So again, it's kind of the idea here is that these individuals have both ways of thinking and they're activated, uh, particular ways of thinking, a specific way of thinking is activated by some external environment or in this case, kind of just priming them through an image of a Chinese or Western uh, idea. Other kinds of primes have shown similar evidence for frame switching. Speaking in one language primes people to have a self-concept associated with that language. So, for example, answering a questionnaire in Chinese primes Chinese self-concepts. What about frame switching in monocultures? Culturals. It is interesting that much research shows that priming ideas in anyone leads to the activation of associated networks. However, multicultural people show more pronounced effects of priming due to more clear-cut mental networks. So kind of the idea here is another study covered uh, that when uh, individuals or uh, Chinese uh, individuals are asked to answer a questionnaire, which is in Chinese, it primes Chinese self-concepts. So again, kind of the switching this environmental um, factor 
um, producing uh, higher likelihoods of frame switching to particular ways of thinking. And there's also evidence of this in monoculturals, as stated, but not to the same extent. And this could, could just be a, for a lot of reasons, but one, um, one reason to hypothesize is that individuals um, who are bicultural are interacting with both cultures all the time, right? And kind of basic uh, neural theory is that the more you interact with um, particular cultural practices or just really any experience, the stronger those neural networks um, get. So um, while individuals who are monocultural uh, still show evidence of these kind of priming effects, because they don't interact with those uh, particular cultural ideas to the same extent that biculturals do, they are going to experience uh, lower effects of priming because of those, because of those neural networks um, not being as strong as uh, individuals who are constantly exposed to it. And for our neuro people out there, kind of the idea here is that our synapses are growing in strength um, through repeated repetition to those environmental, those in this case, cultural um, values. So over time, those synapses grow stronger through experience and those, and thus those, and also relatedly, those uh, neural networks associated with those, those cognitive strategies, those cognitive ways of thinking, those self-concept, those self-concepts uh, become stronger and thus are more prone to priming. Bicultural identity uh, integration. Extent to which biculturals see their two cultural identities as being compatible and live with both as integrated in everyday life. Frame switching depends on this important individual uh, difference factor. High bicultural identity integration involves seeing the two cultural identities as being compatible with each other and living with both of them integrated every day. This contributes to fluid frame switching. Low bicultural identity integration, one must choose between identifying with one cultural identity versus the other at any given time as they are seen as being in opposition with each other leads to more difficulty in frame switching. So kind of the idea here is that um, the extent to which an individual views these two cultures, cultures as being compatible with each other and able to kind of integrate um, these two cultures in their everyday lives contributes to uh, the degree to which and the ease at which uh, they can uh, frame switch. With individuals who find that cultures compatible with each other, um, contributing to more fluid frame switching and uh, individuals who believe that uh, these cultures are not compatible or identify with one cultural identity versus another uh, leading to more difficulty in frame switching and this can be due to a host of reasons so individuals may be interacting less with a particular culture thus kind of reducing the strength of those uh, cognitive strategies those neural networks um, so, so for example, a particular self-concept, um, um, rejecting one approach to self-concepts and thus, um, only identifying with the other one, like an American self-concept, for example, and, uh, thus interacting with it less and then making those, uh, neural networks and those kind of strategy weaker and thus less prone to, uh, being primed by in our previous example, English or Chinese uh, ideas. Also, the idea could be that an individual rejects this uh, particular uh, one cultural identity uh, and going back to our self-concept, so one idea of self-concept um, and thus attempt to effortfully override kind of that automatic frame switching that occurs within some individuals. So they reject that culture and they say, okay, brain, you are not gonna think that way. I'm going to work hard over time to not think in that particular way. And again, by not thinking in that particular way over time, that um, ability to frame switch becomes weaker, thus leading to more difficulty in frame switching overall. That's just one hypothesized reason. Third cultural kids. We talked about this um, early, uh, earlier on in the lecture. These are uh, also known as global nomads or people who travel with expatriate uh, parents and live in places outside their heritage cultures during their formative years. Often children of parents in the military, diplomats, global business ventures, missionaries, or nonprofit organizations. 
They tend to be less ethnocentric and lower measures of prejudice than single culture individuals, but there's limited research on these children. Their first culture is uh, thought to be the heritage culture of their parents. Their second culture is their host uh, country's culture. And their third culture is the expatriate community culture in various host cultures, global identity. So kind of the idea here is you have your parents' culture, you have your uh, host country's culture, and then you're this other expatriate community culture, which exists in numerous uh, organizations, uh, businesses, uh, religious or um, religious organizations, or um, um, business organizations, or um, military bases, or diplomatic offices, for example. So you have these three different cultures uh, combining together to create these third culture kits. And as stated, there's very limited uh, research on um, the developmental outcomes of these children. Multiculturalism and creativity. Adjusting to life in another culture may provide a new and different perspective. This is supported by the finding that visiting another country as tourists does not improve performance on creative tasks. The adjustment that comes with living in another culture that appears to be important for gaining a different perspective. This is especially the case when there is a greater cultural distance, with one caveat uh, discussed at the end, and higher bicultural identification integration. So kind of the idea here is that um, it's not just the idea is not that uh, visiting a particular country lo uh, leads to increased creativity, but rather um, experiencing a, a living in a new culture and kind of being forced to adapt to that culture, uh, which necessarily leads um, is associated with new and different perspectives. So the idea here is that you know you can imagine that uh, visiting a particular country or a different state within the United States, you can just stay within particular areas of the uh, state or country that are much uh, that are uh, more similar to your um, uh, country or your you know, um, location of heritage, uh, which thus would not really challenge you to think differently and take on a new and different perspective. Um, so, you know, you can stay at the Hilton or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever happens, you know, you only eat at uh, particular American fast foods or uh, fast food places um, found within your region of the United States, for example. And that's really not challenging you to do really anything different. Uh, thus, why uh, these researchers argue that tourism um, has been found not to be associated with improvements on creativity tasks. Let's talk about integrative complexity. Willingness and ability to acknowledge and consider different perspectives on the same issue. This willingness is needed to create an integrative and complex perspective. Moving to different places increases integrative complexity, which accounts in parts for changes in creativity. So kind of the degree to which uh, a person is willing and their ability to acknowledge and consider different perspectives um, is needed to um, for or fosters um, the high levels of that, I should say, uh, fosters uh, changes and positive changes in creativity or increase changes in uh, creativity. And moving to a different uh, place is thought to uh, increase uh, integrative complexity. Again, this willingness and ability to acknowledge and consider, consider different perspectives. So the idea is you move to a different country and um, uh, which then uh, kind of uh, forces you, but also you have to have the willingness to, uh, but you consider different perspectives on a new issue, on the same issue uh, that you encounter maybe in your own culture, but you now have different perspectives on that same issue, uh, which, it, which then in return um, kind of um, it's required that you are can integrate those uh, perspectives together in kind of new and complex and creative ways. So researchers looked uh, to uh, argue and find evidence uh, of, of creativity being associated with adjustment. And in this study, participants were assigned to three groups. In the first group, they were told uh, to imagine adapting to a foreign culture. In the second group, uh, they were told that they should imagine observ observing a foreign culture. And in the group, they were provided no instructions. 
So we have three groups. One group is just like, hey, go stand over there in the corner with your with these people. Another group was told, imagine observing a culture, a foreign culture. And then a third group was told, imagine adapting to a foreign culture. Okay. Next participants were then asked to draw an alien. Drawings were rated by coders for creati for creativity. Similarity, so which consisted of similarity to creatures on Earth and the number of sensory aid typicalities. So kind of the idea here is that we're giving you, we have three groups of people, we're giving them certain sets of instruction, we're, we're telling them to draw an alien, and then we're having these independent raters who are, are proficient at this uh, creativity measure to rate the similarity to creatures on Earth, aka their creativity. And what did the researchers find? Well, they found that participants who thought about adapting to a new culture drew more creati creatively than participants in other conditions. Thinking about observing another culture does not yield the same effects. Adaptation to another culture seems key to explain it and enhance creativity. So kind of the idea here is that kind of again, we're, we, we have three groups of people, they're told different instructions and individuals who are told to adapt to a new culture uh, drew more creatively and more more creatively than individuals who were thought who were told to observe um, another culture or um, were given no instructions and in fact in this study um, individuals who were given no instructions were more creative than individuals who um, were told to just observe a culture and that could be related to a whole host of things it might just be a no finding um, but um, kind of the takeaway here is that in this study, the idea here is that that you having to adapt to a culture and take on different perspectives of uh, similar circumstances within a new culture and being um, sh um, shown and um, thinking about different perspectives on, uh, about uh, particular issues or behaviors or just whatever whatever issue um, contributes to elevated levels of creativity and um, as and uh, this study supports this idea in this case individuals who were primed to think about adapting to a new culture being more creative in their alien drawings as compared to individuals who were given no instructions or were told to just observe a foreign culture. Now, so some potential downsides of multicultural experiences. Some uh, researchers argue that uh, moral relative, uh, relativism, which is a belief that right and wrong are not absolute and depend on different cultural factors, can lead to um, individuals uh, or contribute to individuals um, uh, becoming less likely to follow their own moral values, aka their moral compass. So, for example, one study found that people who visited multiple cultures scored higher on moral relativism and were more likely to cheat on a lab task. task. So these individuals argue that being exposed to multiple cultures uh, in some cases can contribute to this idea that there is no right and wrong, and thus I'm just going to YOLO this and do whatever I want. So that's kind of the argument from these re researchers. And finally, our summary. It is difficult to conduct research on acculturation due to a vast number of factors that affect why people move and how they respond in another culture, some of which we covered here, but there are many other factors as well, again, speaking to the complexity of this research and the difficulty of it. Uh, people acculturate using different strategies, which affects how well they can adapt. Acculturation strategies are affected by factors such as personal attitude and discrimination, there are both positive and negative consequences from uh, from acculturation uh, from acculturating to another culture. That's all for this week. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next week. Have a great week. Bye.